I went through with Jeff the pod race, so they're going to start, Joe and he are going to really do a serious breakdown on, because um, I know George won't let the pod race out yet, but they'll start working on dust, mm -hmm. movement, speed, blurring. I know that George has an interest in racing from when he was uh, a little younger uh, that has come over into this picture, that we have this tremendous race scene. When I was young, cars were very important to me. Speed and, and racing became an extreme fascination for me from the age of about 13 on. In The Phantom Menace, I had the opportunity to create what I would call the ultimate race. The evolution of the pod race was a, a major event for us because we all sat down, all the artists, our production designer, George, and we started to outline the basic um, uh, scale of the, the whole pod race. Decisions, decisions, decisions. I wanted the designs for the pods to look like they came from all over the galaxy. So I wanted them to be individual unto themselves, but the nature of the race to stay the same, meaning large engines attached to a small pod. You take that and make that a given, then you can sort of individualize each pod in a very distinct way, depending on how big the alien is that drives it, how rich they are, whether it's uh, corporate sponsored or homemade. It's working! It's working! There were a lot of different pod racers, and this one was kind of a very early concept, and it looks like two 747 engines with this cockpit thing behind it. They incorporated airplane pieces and things into them, but they weren't just generic airplane engines. There was what they were all custom built sci-fi Star Wars, you know, pod racers. That was the first concept model I made for Star Wars. And it was really interesting because it was the first time I was exposed to George looking at artwork or a model or anything like that. And he talked for about 15 minutes about exactly how this thing would work. And the feeling I got was this guy was at the pod race yesterday. And he's telling a story about, well, this thing opens up and this, this electrical energy thing comes out and all these details about it. And I was just amazed. I was mesmerized by the fact that he could just do that. I know he'd been thinking about it for a long time, but it was really interesting to have him look at the model and just, this is how this would work. And, you know, it was really, really fascinating. And I saw him do it a couple other times where it was just off the top of his head. He'd come up with all these mechanical explanations for things. The large models that we built, for the most part, they didn't wind up in the film. They wound up being model and texture reference for the CG department. Some of them did. There was like a hangar set where all the pods were parked and we had them in there. But it was really interesting to go from that early model that was, you know, cobbled together in my garage to these bigger versions of these engines that are, you know, four feet long and incorporating that level of detail. One of the things I came up with just to kind of expedite things was a mold on these detail panels. This is what we would get out of it and it's just this floppy plastic type material paint it up and you get something that looks like that which you could take and wrap around these tube structures on the pod racers to put other details on top of it but it's just kind of a neat trick. Every pod is completely different. There are no shared parts between them. The idea is that a lot of these were supposed to be kind of hand tinkered together in, uh, in backyards. <laughs> Some of them are more well-funded racing teams, but they're all really different. And we tried to, to make them all fly a little bit different. We only used real, tangible uh, models for when they were stationary, and they were used in a couple of shots on the, again, stationary on the starting grid. But everything else that's in motion was a computer graphic version of each of those engines and pods. Seeing a full-size pod for the first time is very exciting. I mean, it's like, that's something where you just had a notion of something and kind of fiddled with it and wrote it down on a piece of paper. And, and, and I took that to, to Doug and we started drawing them up. But to actually now see a real one standing there in front of you is, you know, that's part of the fun of making movies. That's why I'm doing it. Now we're cooking. Yeah, I like that much better. And, uh, you know, in terms of this, you can just, just put a bolt there or something. It doesn't need much. Yeah, we'll put some plating on it. Yeah. yeah. You ready? You want to try it out? Sure. Yeah, that's a better seat, too. I want it. The seat just should be in there. Being in a spacecraft, I'm like, that's my pod? Is it still possible to loosen these up a little bit? Yeah. That was just fun. It was just 
the best. It was very interesting to build 18 pod engines, uh, the engines and, and the pods. Well, the engines are the size of 747 engines. I mean, they're just huge. They're 20, 25, 30 feet long, 12 to 15 feet wide, which is over the maximum that any truck is allowed to take. And that becomes immediately a challenge. And it's also something we could never have done in the heat of Tunisia. It just would have been impossible. I think all of the engines took about 12 weeks to build to have that kind of crew working in that kind of environment would have been very, very difficult. And um, it was much easier to build them and then transport them. The transport was fantastic, though. It was a really major thing. We could only drive at night. We had ferries that we had to put them on. We even flew a lot of the engines in, in, in a Russian MTV 800, which is the largest transport plane in the world. That was a, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> The race started out as a collection of shots of every racing object I could find. Some of it was, you know, racing footage of cars. Some of it was shots I made myself of uh, my son with an alien mask on looking like Sebulba. And then eventually we had our animatic department do the task of creating actual shots. <laughs> A lot of people don't understand the process of what we go through when we do animatics. Um, traditionally, people have used storyboards for years to be able to uh, illuminate a sequence. And they've always been great tools for people to actually understand what was going on, what you had to build. A fantastic tool for uh, everybody in production because you could actually start to break down a sequence. So what we've been doing uh, for a number of years now is creating these little animatics, which basically impart the action, the pace, and the angle, and the actual story of the shot that George wants to use to be able to make a movie. I remember the day that uh, I had first shown a pod race shot with two engines and a cockpit behind it racing through the desert at camera. Um, I remember the first day I showed that to, to Rick and George, and Rick gave me a high five. They were like, oh, this is going to work. The stages of an animatic are we get a request to do the animatic either in the form of a storyboard or George will just come upstairs and said, I had an idea for a shot. Have something like this where the camera moving this way and the ship blows up. Then we will build models in the computer that represent the specific shapes, spaceships, terrains, characters that are required to be in the shot. And using 3D animation programs, we'll set up the camera in the place that the storyboard or George requested and we'll go through a process of animating what's supposed to happen in the shot. All it is is a very cost-efficient way for an animator, an editor, and a director to make a little movie, to make a sequence. But it's a very powerful tool for people, and it is especially great for us to be able to show actors and the crew what it is we're trying to get out of a day's work. Because, you know, often you can enter a blue screen world and stay there for two or three weeks, and people forget what's around them and what they're actually trying to achieve. So we find it a really valuable um, tool to be able to express ourselves and also to express what we're doing to other people. Film is inherently uh, a moving medium, and storyboards don't express that fully. So, especially in the example of the pod race, we decided to create these computer-generated animatics to put the storyboards in motion. They edited the whole thing together, got a really good idea of the, of the timing and pace and, and the speeds that were involved, and exactly what shots were necessary to tell the story. And that was tremendously useful to us. I mean, a lot of our shots are direct, duplicates of the animatics. Ooh, there goes Quadranero's power coupling. George and Rick have really reinvented filmmaking. The traditional linear process of pre-production, production, and post-production might not have been, certainly for a film like this, the most efficient process. My initial job was to use low-end computer animation to create shots of the pod race and to pre-visualize that nine-minute sequence. You couldn't shoot a sequence like that without videomatics. You wouldn't know whether you were in a canyon or whether you were in arches. Uh, you wouldn't know what the lighting would be. You don't know whether it was turning right or turning left. Speed was the important thing to George. It was a kinetic 
movement of vast, enormous objects going at a relentless speed. There was a lot of discussion that went into how does a pod fly, uh, and how the, the individual engines each, uh, each have the anti-gravity levitators, and, and uh, how that works with the cockpit, and how they steer. You have to figure that these are, the engines are sort of infinitely malleable in terms of their thrust and their, you know, and how much power you can get to them, how much thrust and in what direction and all that kind of stuff. And then it's tied with magnetic energy field to the other one, so you got two of them in tandem. They lift up they repel the ground. and they repel the ground, but the, the, the trick is is that if they go more than like 10 or 12 feet off the ground, then they're basically just shooting, you know, and they'll, they'll you know, you can, with, with thrust and everything, you can get them to go pretty high, but then they'll come back down again. Anakin flies off of this 100-foot uh, this drop, then what does the pod do, and how does the pilot not just immediately crash when he gets down? And we thought about, uh, okay, so he's, he's losing his lift, so he has to make up for lift by pitching the engines back and opening up the air brakes. And, and uh, so some thought went into what the pod physics are. It's Skywalker! One of the problems in terms of production was how were we actually going to film these backgrounds? We knew we could shoot everything on a helicopter and we could go to various different locations, but there was no way we could do the speed. We began a process of uh, uh, essentially negotiation about what needed to be built as a set and what we were going to add later. At first, uh, models looked like a good, good possibility for some of the more enclosed environments, but once they start flying and once we start flying really fast through these open terrains, models uh, really weren't practical. We shot um, a number of the full-size pod racer engines and cockpits in a stage in Leavesden. I give uh, uh, Chris a script and I say, read this off, and sometimes if it gets a little out of the way, I'll sit and yell at him myself. Okay, you're coming up on Sebulba. Sebulba's ahead of you there. You see him, he's maneuvering, he's flaming somebody, he's exploded somebody in front of you, and bang, pieces flying past your head. Try to fix it now, Jake. Practically okay. looking at one hand. The way these films were put together, they're shot very much like a documentary film, and then the action is staged, and then I shoot around it. I don't stage for the camera. And as a result, there are a lot of things that happen pretty much by accident. It, it lends a, a, an aura of authenticity to everything. Look up and pull back, and duck! Just that, yeah, there you go. Good, okay. We're coming alongside him, Jake. He's on your left now, look at him. You're gonna beat him, Jake. But he's not gonna play fair, he's gonna bump you. Bump! Bang! Fist push your head, duck, duck! And cut. Okay, Jake Lloyd is finished. We'll come back. We'll have some more fun. Yeah. Okay, you look after yourself, Jakey. We knew we could shoot everything on a helicopter and we could go to various different locations to try and create the whole uh, uh, arena of where we were going to shoot. But as the storyboards became more and more real, John Knoll turned to me and he said, you know, I think I can do this all in computer graphics. A lot of shots were traveling at tremendous speed, and at the beginning of a shot, something that's way on the far end, way out on the horizon, would be going past camera. So it either meant uh, tremendously large miniatures or helicopter plates, but uh, exotic terrains that George wanted didn't really exist anywhere. That really leaves computer graphics of some kind as about the only real solution. <laughs> We started research in Southwest in terms of butte formations, looking at the Grand Canyon for rocks, looking literally everywhere we could find exotic rock formations in the desert, and we just merged them all together. A lot of these uh, diagonals are really helping. Yeah, and I put like a little uh, yeah, sort that's, of flatter area in there that, that helps could a lot. come down. So, how many of these like backgrounds are there? Like, are there like? Well. A million of them, or <laughs> because we're, I mean, we're going to all the trouble of making this uh, completely computer-generated environment for hundreds of shots. Exactly. Well, it should yeah. be something that we can't That's see obviously. in the real world. Don't be afraid to uh, to push it a bit. Okay. Actually, it looks really nice. Mm -hmm. So, does that mean changing the model, or uh, is that the talus we're running through? If we're close enough to the wall. <clears throat> there's not much we can do to change the talus. On the pod race, we're doing 
an entire 10 minute sequence, all you're seeing are completely computer generated landscapes. And it's, it's kind of a difficult thing to do. As it is in the picture, there's always something you're looking at in the foreground. It's not really <coughs> about the background, so. <laughs> but, uh, I've you heard know, this speech before. Well, <laughs> well, no, no, but I mean, I, I think that the landscapes look pretty good. I think he's doing a remarkably good, good job. So, <laughs> so anyway, just so you see what, uh, what the shots feel like with something in there, even though what's in there is, uh, is pretty temporary. Looks good to me. Uh, I've seen enough tests now that I'm, I'm comfortable that that's going to work. The pods look good. Well, they'll, they'll be better in their final forms. <laughs> Remember in the end, John, you're not looking at the background. You're not watching the pods. You're listening to the music. <laughs> <laughs> the interaction of all those things going at 500 miles an hour was quite extraordinary to see that process evolve. <laughs> George wanted the pod crashes to have much more of the, the uh, energy of a Formula One car crash, where it's not a lot of flame. That's not really what it's about. It's about inertia. These things uh, hit, and they just sort of keep going and going, and parts shred off of them, and they tumble, and pieces go everywhere. <laughs> When Sebulba and Anakin were at the end of the race and Sebulba's motors take off and then he goes tumbling, 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 that actually was a model that actually uh, tumbles and skids and then at the very end jumps up and stops. The camera operator said, well, hey, why don't we just screw a piece of wood in there so it hits something. They put bungee cords and then launched it. And that's what you see in the movie. And it just uh, slides along and boom, hits that thing. Okay, Jeff, you ready? So I'm going to be operating a sawzall underneath, okay. which, which vibrates the whole thing. Right, so when we start the shot, this should be going. <clears throat> or shaking. We just need like uh, two or three seconds of, of it doing that before, bang, fire the, fire the charge. And roll camera. Now, we're getting the, uh, the big shake here. Why was it working before? Let's try it a different way. So everybody ready to go otherwise? Yeah. I want to try the handshake approach. The large pod race arena was a, about a 40-foot miniature that we shot out in the back lot, back at ILM, populated largely with ILM employees. Just tell everyone to look to see if they have water next to them. If they have water, it has to go. Action! <laughs> It was a combination of uh, computer-generated uh, people and uh, blue screen elements that we shot for, for mid-range shots. And then for shots in the pod race, we're actually flying through the arena. We had uh, a bunch of colored Q-tips that were in the stands. I and mean, by playing fans across the, the back of it, you could get some subtle motion in the crowds so that they, they have a, an appearance of being alive. You know, we had tons of fun with all the background characters in this movie. One of George's favorites is a little character called Rats Tyrell. He's about two foot seven, I think, and he's the smallest of the pod racers. He originally was only just in a couple of shots. He's actually the little guy who goes into the cave and ends up smacking into one of those um, columns that are there, dying in a fireball, I think. Although we always wanted him to shoot out of the, the top of the cave because we wanted to use him again, so he's so great. But after George saw him, and we'd done a little run cycle with him because he's got these little sort of eight inch legs or smaller. George started adding more of him into the movie. The other time that we get to see the Rats family, or as he calls them, the Rats tourists, it's the establishing shot of Qui-Gon, uh, Padme, and Jar Jar walking into Mos Espa. But in the background behind Jar Jar are about eight little rat Tyrell people, one tour guide and about seven of them, and he's sort of waving them on, sort of like, over here, people, and we actually put a little digital camera in the hands of one of them, like they're tourists coming to town for the start of the, of the big pod race. <laughs> and then the final shot that you get to see there, 
the, the Rats uh, family and the Padres, is just a throwaway shot. It's Watto talking to Qui-Gon, and they're negotiating the post deal of Anakin going off with, uh, with Qui-Gon. But through the back door of the private box, you get to see a Rats adult and two little rat kids walking along, sort of weeping quietly to themselves, uh, sort of as a connection to the driver who's disappeared in the race. It was amazing to work with George because he'd say, oh, put them in here and, and put them in there and, and put them in there. With the Deadbolt puppet, it was nice because it was actually a practical puppet that we did. Because I think there was actually possibly 15 to 20 characters that I heard that they were going to be puppets and then it started to change and turned out into about, about two. <laughs> so we, we ended up making these two puppets and one was Deadbolt and it was a great opportunity for me because I was excited to do at least one. We figured out we wanted to make it into a hand puppet. It was molded and casted out of, I think it was latex or parts of it, probably maybe foam latex, and then put some other stuff inside of it to make it a little more strength, like cheesecloth or something. And then after done, we put cures and then put polyfoam in it. And it was a really neat kind of armor type costume on it that was like, I think vacuum form pieces, and then they cover, covered leather on it and um, dyed the leather and had little pieces of uh, I don't know, Greebly's, I know we call it for little model parts and everything. The green sticks that you see sticking out of the puppet itself is uh, basically puppeteering rods that we use to manipulate the puppet and make it come alive. It was me and Mark Siegel who puppeteered it on set and John Noel came by as, as the uh, visual effects supervisor and to shoot the, the character and it was a lot of fun. It was like about a, a day's worth of filming and then they pick about three seconds of the film and they put it in there. So it's one of those things where I'm always kind of used to, I'm just glad that we were able to make it and it, puppeteer it and have it on film. And then, you know, when you see it, you can pause it to see it and stuff. And sometimes you have it a little, a little longer, but usually it's, it's a few seconds long, but it's the way it goes, you know. And back again, it's the mighty Doug Boat with that incredible racing machine, the Boat Dream 327. The Pitroids were, were one of George's favorite little antic characters. Hey! Ah. Hit the nose! Ah. Ah. The first one we actually ever see in the movie is standing in the backyard. In behind that is the 2001 pod, Frank Poole's pod, that many, many people may not know that's actually there in Watto's junkyard. There's a wonderful other uh, bit with the pitroids when one of the pod race drivers comes in partway through the race and his crew of pitroids comes out to assess what's wrong with the engine. And of course, it all goes wrong as one of them gets sucked into the engine, destroying it so that they can never leave the race line again. And we get that nice sort of three shot of pit, the, the three pitroids, the, the see no evil, hear no evil. We get to see Jabba in this movie, completely retrofit from uh, even the special edition. This is a brand new uh, state-of-the-art Jabba, Jabba 3.0, I think we called him. It was actually the animator who was anime length shot came up with the gag of the flick. <laughs> that was never scripted, and that was never something that I asked, but Steve Rollins, the animator, came up with that. I showed it to George, and he almost fell out of his chair laughing. We would give George a viewing of the, the very first thing we put together to, to get some feedback on the direction that we were going. It's the it's kind of bad camera work that I like the most of all. That's the thing that tells you that it's real, only you obviously know it's not real, so it's like it confuses you in a way that's very satisfying. <laughs> It's funny, no matter how many times I see the pod race, and I've seen it a hundred times now, it is still so amazing. It is very, very cool.